Encyclopedia Section 162. The doctrine of the notion is divided into three parts. One, the first is the doctrine of the subjective or formal notion. Two, the second is the doctrine of the notion invested with the character of immediacy or of objectivity. The three, the third is the doctrine of the idea, the subject, object, the unity of notion and objectivity, the absolute truth. The common logic covers only the matters which come before us here as a portion of the third part of the whole system, together with the so-called laws of thought, which we have already met, and in the applied logic it adds a little about cognition. This is combined with psychological, metaphysical, and all sorts of empirical materials, which were introduced because when all was done, those forms of thought could not be made to do all that was required of them. But with these additions, the science lost its unity of aim. Then there was a further circumstance against the common logic. Those forms which at least do belong to the proper domain of logic are supposed to be categories of conscious thought only, of thought too in the character of understanding, not of reason. The preceding logical categories, those viewed as of being and essence, are, it is true, no mere logical modes or entities. They are proved to be notions in their transition or their dialectical element, and in their return into themselves and totality. But they are only in a modified form notions. Compare sections, or encyclopedia sections, 84 and 112. Notions rudimentary, or what is the same thing, notions for us. The antithetical, the antithetical term into which each category passes, or in which it shines, so producing correlation, is not characterized as a particular. The third in which they return to unity is not categorized, pardon, the third in which they return to unity is not characterized as a subject or an individual, nor is there any explicit statement that the category is identical in its antithesis. In other words, its freedom is not expressly stated. And all this because the category is not universality. What generally passes current under the name of a notion is a mode of understanding, or even a mere general representation, and therefore, in short, a finite mode of thought. Again, compare section 60, uh, Encyclopedia section 62. The notion of the, the logic of the notion is usually treated as a science of form only and understood to deal with the form of notion, judgment, and syllogism as form. The logic of the notion is usually treated as a science of form only, and understood to deal with the form of notion, judgment, and syllogism as form, without in the least touching the question whether anything is true. The answer to that question is supposed to depend on the content only. If the logical forms of the notion were really dead and inert, receptacles of conceptions and thoughts, careless of what they contained, knowledge about them would be an idle curiosity.
which the truth might dispense with. On the contrary, they really are, as forms of the notion, the vital spirit of the actual world. That only is true of the actual, which is true in virtue of these forms, through them and in them. As yet, however, the truth of these forms has never been considered or examined on their own account any more than their necessary interconnection. Hegel, Encyclopedia of Philosophy, Section 1, Logic, The Science of the Idea in and for Itself, Chapter 9, Third Subdivision of Logic, The Doctrine of the Notion, Quasi-Subdivision A, The Subjective Notion, Infra-Subdivision A, The Notion as Notion. Encyclopedia, section 163. The notion as notion contains the three following moments or functional parts. One, the first is universality, meaning that it is free equality with itself in its special character. Two, the second is particularity, that is, the specific character in which the universal continues serenely equal to itself. Uh, pardon, uh, I'll start again. The notion as notion contains the three following moments or functional parts. One, the first is universality, meaning that it is in free equality, with itself in its specific character. Two, the second is particularity, that is, the specific character in which the universal continues serenely equal to itself. Three, the third is individuality, meaning the reflection into self of the specific characters of universality and particularity which, Negative self-unity has complete and original determinateness without any loss to its self-identity or universality. Individual and actual are the same thing. Only the former has issued from the notion and is thus, as a universal, stated expressly as a negative identity with itself. The actual, because it is at first no more than a potential or immediate unity of essence and existence, may possibly have effects, but the individuality of the notion is the very source of effectiveness, effective moreover no longer as the cause is, with a show of effecting something else, but effective of itself. Individuality, however, is not to be understood to mean the immediate or natural individual, as when we speak of individual things or individual men. For that special phase of individuality does not appear till we come to judgment. Every function of the every function and moment of the notion is itself the whole notion, see Encyclopedia section 160, but the individual or subject is the notion expressly put as totality. Encyclopedia section 163, infra section 1. The notion is generally associated in our minds with abstract generality, and on that account it is often described as a general conception. We speak accordingly of the notions of color, plant, animal, and similar. They are supposed to be arrived at 
by neglecting the particular features which distinguish the different colors, plants, and animals from each other, and by retaining those common to them all. This is the aspect of the notion which is familiar to understanding, and feeling is in the right when it stigmatizes such hollow and empty notions as mere phantoms and shadows. But the universal of the notion is not a mere sum of features common to several things, confronted by a particular which enjoys an existence of its own. It is, on the contrary, self-particularizing or self-specifying and with undimmed clearness finds itself at home in its antithesis for the sake both of cognition and of our practical conduct it is of the utmost importance that the real universal should not be confused with what is nearly held in common all those charges which the devotees of feeling make against thought, and especially against philosophic thought, and the reiterated statement that it is dangerous to carry thought to what they call to great lengths, originate in the confusion of these two things. Uh, if you're wondering about the staccato reading, uh, there are spaces between the words. Uh, if you're reading the, the, the print edition from uh, Project Gutenberg, uh, their free edition, other uh, spaces between the words. It may be retained in the uh, print edition from Amazon. Uh, so I'm trying to read it as if it were music uh, to... Uh, see if I can hold it. Uh, we call these in Arabic uh, med. Uh, so med are uh, pauses. Usually they're one to six med, and every med is about two seconds. And so I'm looking at it uh, to just kind of judge what it is. It's rare that you'll have six, but there are a few. Um, okay, uh, returning. The universal in its true and comprehensive meaning is a thought which, as we know, costs thousands of years to make it enter into the consciousness of men. The thought did not gain its full recognition till the days of Christianity. The Greeks, in other respects so advanced, knew neither God nor even man in their true universality. The gods of the Greeks were only particular powers of the mind. And the universal God, the God of all nations, was to the Athenian still a God concealed. They believed in the same way that an absolute gulf separated themselves from the barbarians. Man, as man, was not then recognized to be of infinite worth and to have infinite rights. The question has been asked, why slavery has vanished from modern Europe? One special circumstance after another has been adduced in explanation of this phenomenon, but the real ground why there are no more slaves in Christian Europe is only to be found in the very principle of Christianity itself, the religion of absolute freedom. Only in Christendom is man respected as man in his infinitude and universality. What the slave is without is the recognition that he is a person, and the principle of personality is universality. The master looks upon his slave not as a person, but as a selfless thing. The slave is not himself reckoned as I. His I is his master. So I'll take a pause to discuss slavery. As it has existed uh, from time immemorial, or at least since the year 6000, uh, pardon, since the year 4000 BCE, or thereabouts. Uh, so 
Christianity does not permit slavery uh, in the sense that a person, a, a, a human being, I should say, can be captured and sold as if he were or she were cattle. Uh, because Christianity does allow you to use farm animals uh, for food. Uh, you can eat uh, beef, uh, pork, and actually there's a, uh, a concept called the vision of Thomas, uh, where you can eat anything that was presented in a cloud or in a kind of a dream blanket uh, to Thomas. And you'll also find something similar in the book of Ezekiel, anything uh, permitting Christians to divert from a Jewish law, which was only meant for this community who are genetic relatives. So almost every dietary restriction, restriction uh, in Judaism has some concept that one of the tribes, if not more of them, have an allergy or some type of bodily uh, rejection of, uh, of a food. So for instance, uh, pork or pig specifically, I actually think they meant there's either a pig that was raised on a, uh, a particular hill, and it still is in Egypt, in Cairo, uh, called uh, uh, Mukottam, or in Egypt, Mukottam. Uh, there are pigs there raised by uh, Christians, very ancient Christians, uh, who consume trash. And or they consume other materials from that mountain, and they're considered magical, if not sacred. And, and so as a result of that, it's called khanzir. That particular food was banned because they knew it in Egypt. Now, if you want to extract that in Transjordan, there are warthogs, and these things grow as big as, honestly, uh, a, a small cow. Uh, and they're very, very difficult to uh, manage or kill or do anything like that. Uh, the Norse god Thor is carried forward by these warthogs, these boars, uh, very huge animals. Sometimes he's carried forward by sheep as well, just to kind of uh, moderate the opinion of those who might be following him and when he appears in the form of uh, Yahweh or something else. Um, but in this case, uh, he, that particular pig is also banned because to go out and hunting for it uh, will get, I think it takes like seven people to die uh, if you're I mean, without a gun or something uh, before you can master a warthog. You can see uh, the story of uh, Sir Gawain or, or Gavin and the Green Knight uh, and what it takes to kill a warthog. Um, so beyond that, uh, pigs, except through their gluteus maximus, are known not to sweat. And so what, whatever food you feed them, they keep their toxins in their body. Uh, now their toxins could be something you desire. Uh, certain animals produce certain toxins that you prefer. For the overwhelming Israeli or Jewish palate, those toxins are unhealthy uh, because of a genetic reality. So because of that, that uh, uh, pork, except for uh, my understanding. Seth. So, except for my understanding, the, except for the uh, the hind region, uh, doesn't sweat or doesn't sweat properly, and so it is banned. Uh, overwhelmingly, Christians uh, who were not Jewish as well uh, from this ethnic line didn't have these allergies or were not known to have these allergies, so they were permitted to eat whatever they wanted. Uh, there may be some cultural reasons why they couldn't do it. So. Uh, what you own as a farm animal, you can eat. Uh, now, if you own, and that's true in Christianity. So logically, and this is a logic text, if you were to own a person or a, a, a human being, I should say, and person is a word uh, that's used uh, to denote, in, in the context we're reading, uh, someone with a high caste. And we'll get to that in a minute. If you can own a person or a human being, uh, then you could eat them. <laughs> and so that's something that uh, does not exist in Judaism or uh, Islam and several other traditions. You can't eat them. Uh, so 
it was just understood you it, it was just understood this way and so farm animals uh and, and there is an absolute freedom then in christianity now you can employ a person uh to do work and to do very difficult labor and uh that person may not because they're employed by you uh they have negotiated to the best of their ability and their their cast a salary meaning that you have very little responsibility responsibility uh for their actions Uh, and so you have very little responsibility for their actions because they've negotiated a wage and should have asked you uh, what the complete position was, and they've agreed that that wage was enough. Now, sometimes the wage is in currency. Sometimes the wage is in uh, barter. So, for instance, Irish uh, people were brought over to the United States uh, for passage. So they wanted to leave Ireland. Uh, and Irish people love to travel. Uh, for one reason or another, they wanted to leave. And so they left, uh, and they needed to pay for their boat passage. So we'll bring you over here uh, to the United States, and we'll house you. But exchange, in exchange for coming here and housing you, you have to stay seven years, because again, Irish people like to travel, and may have just come over and left again. Uh, you stay for seven years uh, in our home, and then you provide us uh, some type of home-based service, uh, and or work in a plant or a mill or something in exchange for travel and your rooming, and I would assume, uh, but I don't have the contracts that uh, food was included as well. Uh, so for seven years, Irish people were in this condition, and it was considered uh, legal uh, under Christian law for this to happen because there was an exchange made. After seven years, uh, they were overwhelmingly free to leave, whether or not they did, uh, and they were not considered what were called indentured servants because they paid their bill. Of course, some people uh, cheated and didn't allow people to leave. Some people didn't want to leave. Uh, and extended their uh, service, uh, maybe in exchange for the same thing, uh, or a number of other situations. Uh, very early on in the American colonies uh, here, uh, there were people of African descent who also took the same deal. Uh, they, in exchange for passage to the United States, there had been African people in the Americas at least since the year 600 BC, uh, the people who are known as the Ibu had come over uh, around that time. Uh, they, their tradition says that they walked over here uh, from West Africa, from Nigeria area, maybe uh, a little bit further south, south than that. If you look at a map of uh, Nigeria or kind of the Horn of Africa and trace it over, uh, you'll reach uh, Mexico and the place where they landed uh, today it's called um, uh, conveniently called Veta Cruz, uh, meaning truly we did cross over here, uh, and this is and they were uh, called the Olmecs. And so, if you look at an Olmec head, uh, you have these very large stone structures, which are not uncommon on the African continent. They have very specifically not just. Uh, Black African or Bantu African, but Ibu features. Uh, and so they came over here around that time. And so there were Black people here. And what do they mean by they walked over here? Uh, it's very likely that they had uh, uh, canoes or, or, or it took them a long time. I'm not quite sure. It's the tradition that they walked over on the ocean here. Uh, uh, but they, they, they made their way here, and it may be part of a secret of how they got here. So there was some concept, at least from 600 uh, before, before Christ or before the Common Era, uh, that uh, people of Bantu, or Black African heritage, came over. And so there were stories of it, and when the opportunity arrived uh, for others to come over here, there were also Arabs uh, who in the United States... Um, are akin to, but not exactly the same as those who are Red Indians. Uh, the, the difference between us is, is quite significant, and I do have uh, both heritage. Uh, and so they knew of this land over here, 
and they desire to come across. And so they were indentured for seven years as well. However, on the African continent, slavery was practiced um, by those same Arabs. And eventually people were captured and entered into what is called chattel slavery. And chattel slavery means you are owned in a similar way as an animal. Um, and so since animal brutality occurred, uh, the same thing can make, so whatever you could do to your cattle, you could do to a chattel slave. And unfortunately, another chattel group were women. Women were entered into marriages and they were considered chattel as well. Uh, and so this was a way for some people to own other people. And it was very unchristian, uh, thing to do very unchristian. Uh, even if you employ a person and you don't treat them very well, uh, this chattel slavery idea was not in accord with Christianity. And so it, and it had its results. So women and specifically black Africans were brought over. Uh, initially, women came over uh, with their husbands uh, and they had whatever status women had in Europe. Uh, but when they were, when chattel slavery occurred, uh, women were also uh, placed into this situation and could be sold and purchased in the same way. And so this is something that occurred within Christianity later. Uh, and it wasn't really within Christianity, with individuals uh, who had interactions with other groups. So that's what he means that, uh, that within the Christian tradition, a man was free from slavery, or a woman was free from slavery, technically, but um, they would agree, I'll clarify, on the type of labor they would provide through contract. So there is in the United States, uh, an underlying principle that we all have an inherent right to contract, uh, whatever we want. And the only thing limiting that right to contract is the contract that we signed to be citizens of the United States. And to be citizens of the United States means that we have a contract that says we are limited in how we can create other contracts as a result of that. So uh, if you don't want it, you would have to renounce your citizenship and go elsewhere where your particular style of contract was still inherent and uh, allowed you to do the thing that you wanted. And I will tell you, there are very few places on earth uh, that is the case, which in a contained earth allows it to be uh, a workable system uh, in an in a otherwise dif uh, diverse world. Okay, so what's the difference between uh, Judaism uh, in Christianity, let's say Islam and Christianity. In Judaism, uh, the concept of slavery is understood and continues to be understood as a possibility. However, uh, and this is the case too, well, I'll, I'll stay with Judaism because it didn't really work out this way uh, in the Islamic tradition. Uh, in Judaism, you can uh, have a slave and that slave can be a foreigner or he could be a Jew. Um, and and Every uh, jubilee, uh, that person, uh, that individual, uh, was freed. So a jubilee is about 50 years. Uh, sometimes you have micro jubilees, and if you're captured, uh, it's not that you wait 50 years. Say that you become a slave, uh, and the jubilee is in three years. Uh, so now the next jubilee, I believe, is, I think, in the 2030s or something. Uh, so if the Jubilee arrives, uh, you're freed. You're, you're free from slavery. If you happen to be enslaved earlier, like at the beginning, before uh, the 50 years, then you wouldn't be. So there's a, a concept that at some point you'll be freed. Uh, and you, you can't harm a person. You can't, uh, the, the things you can do with another individual, a human being, you definitely can't eat them. Uh, and you have to treat a person with a number of rules, and there's a lot of rules around what slavery is. I would argue that slavery within Judaism is, when it when it was practiced, or if it is practiced, it's very similar to being a government uh, official or a government worker, where you work for the federal government or maybe you work for a police department or somewhere else, and there are things like you can't use drugs, you can't... Uh, necessarily take a bribe or certain types of transactions you can't do other things you can't do because you are you have a different status uh, so uh, no one wants to be enslaved 
but the slavery concept within Judaism uh, is not uh, what most people understand it. And the place where this was practiced uh, most clearly was actually in uh, the Ottoman Empire, uh, which took over for the uh, Byzantium Empire. Uh, you had something very similar where uh, you would enslave a person, but then they would become a government official. They would be sent to school and they would do government labor. Uh, and they often had quite a bit of prestige in it. Uh, but there's, and after, at the Jubilee, uh, they would be relieved from service. And you find bishops the same way. Uh, bishops at a certain age, 78 is their Jubilee or around there. They're relieved from their service, a type of slavery. Now, uh, the last tradition we'll discuss, because I don't know about slavery within Hinduism or Buddhism uh, or any other culture uh, because you have a caste system. Uh, instead of slavery, you have people who do certain work. So the Brahmanic caste is there to interpret the holy doctrines. And the holy doctrines have a lot of law that uh, go with them. And so once those holy doctrines are interpreted, uh, the next caste, the Kasatriya, uh, who is the princely caste, but also the uh, warrior caste and the business caste, uh, they're, they're all of that. Uh, they take that Brahmanic interpretation and they apply it. And once it's applied, the Shudra caste, uh, for some reason, uh, many Greeks, when they came there with Alexander the Great to India, uh, entered the Shudra caste. Uh, these are similar to what I meant with Jewish uh, slavery. Uh, they, uh, at, they administer everything. They are the administrators. Uh, so if you find a person at a university in administration or in government, uh, that person uh, is working as if they were a shudra. Uh, though, what is your role at the university? Are you in business? Are you in leadership? Are you pushing papers? Uh, it's the people who move the papers around are, are in that caste. And people uh, are mixed in their caste. So my caste is, uh, I'm more kasatriya than I am Brahmin by one uh, blood quantum, but it's a significant amount. Uh, so when you talk about quantum in that respect. Um, so here, uh, so, that, so that's in that world you have, uh, or within the Confucian world, Confucian Taoist world, uh, you have roles. Are you the father? Are you the mother? Are you the oldest son? Are you the oldest daughter? Uh, et cetera. These are these roles uh, and everyone does what they're supposed to do in their role, and then society flows from there. I'm not sure if anyone necessarily tells you what to do in your role, but you learn it and then you apply it. And if it's not applied completely, then society doesn't function as well as the belief. Um, within the Islamic tradition, uh, the in Islam, the word Islam means an obedience, and a Muslim is one who is obedient. Uh, so in the Islamic tradition, slavery is understood to exist. Uh, it is said to be something that people wanted to phase out. Uh, so it is a progressive understanding. But uh, a slave is one who is captured. Uh, I don't know that slaves can be sold, uh, but it is possible. I think you go to war, you capture people, and then they enter into slavery. And it's a slavery only for that person not for their children. Their children are not born slaves. Uh, and if they end up having children, you can control whether or not they can marry. Those free individuals have to be supported by you. So as an Islamic slave or a slave of a Muslim person captured in war properly uh, can, has to be afforded the right uh, to eat the same food as you um, and sit at a table to eat. Right, So you can't treat them as you would an animal or a dog or something like that. Uh, and they are, um, they're cared for and their children are cared for. And if it's done according to kind of a religious concept, they, they, come, they, they become very similar to uh, foster children more than adopted. Uh, there is no adoption within the Islamic tradition, but there's a fostering. So for some reason, this person or these people could not, function enough to not to defend themselves against you uh, and they were not killed in war and so you become their custodian uh, for a time period so these are the ways that slavery has worked again as Hegel says before just because something is logical doesn't mean that it is right uh, the logical uh, what would happen from this 
if you were to engage in any form of uh, enslaving, uh, you would be using your will to do so, and you might find yourself uh, the subject of human trafficking or a rebellion or some other long-term, for now, uh, reparations uh, are due uh, to enslaved African people, possibly uh, indentured Irish people uh, and others, and maybe to women uh, who were under chattel, uh, chattel marriage or chattel slavery uh, themselves. So you, you or your, your descendants will then owe some form of reparation uh, for it. So you willed this, you accepted it, you benefited from it, and maybe even your nation benefited. But the result of your will is that you may have, uh, and very likely will have, some payment due uh, from you or your 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 descendants later on. Uh, so as you will something to be that's logical, you have to remember that there are also results to it. So I say all that just so we can get back to saying uh, Christianity prefers capitalism. Uh, and that you negotiate your relationship with another person. You are free in your negotiations with another person, but then you're bound by your contract uh, until you can find a judge or someone else to adjudicate it. So if you're ever making a contract in the United States, even though it's against principle, uh, but we've agreed to be uh, contracted in the United States and then to follow its laws, uh, you can only contract a person for 12 months. Every contract is for 12 months and has to be renewed. Uh, there are some exceptions to this, like insurance and a few others. But in general, every job you have and everything is only for one year. Uh, this may change in different districts and states. And again, this is the United States, not in Europe or other places. Contracts are for a year. So if you've made a poor contract, uh, you should be able to get out of it. Um, that's assuming the court believes it and finds in your favor. If you can't, law, here's a principle of law uh, before we get back to the text. There are the written law and there is what you can enforce. Uh, so the written law may say that every contract is for a year, but if you can't enforce that contract, you may be subject to it for more than a year. Uh, the pandemic said that people were contracted to pay their rent. However, um, they, the, the federal government, which we're under contract with, said, no, we're going to excuse that and do our best to get some money towards those contractors. And certain courts have agreed or disagreed with it. So every law, every law uh, that exists on the books is only as effective as it can be enforced. So I'll leave you with that. So backing up a bit. One special circumstance after another has been adduced an explanation of this phenomenon. But the real ground why there are no more slaves in Christian Europe is only to be found in the very principle of Christianity itself, the religion of absolute freedom. Only in Christendom is man respected as man, in his infinitude and universality. What the slave is without is the recognition that he is a person, and the principle of personality is universality. The master looks upon his slave not as a person, but as a selfless thing. The slave is not himself reckoned as I. His I is his master. The distinction referred to above between what is nearly in common and what is truly universal is strikingly expressed by Rousseau in his famous Contract Social, when he says that the laws in when he says that the laws of a state must spring from the universal will, pardon my Quebecois, volonté générale, but need not on that account be the will of all, volonté de tous. Rousseau would have made a sounder contribution towards a theory of the state if he had always kept this distinction in sight. The general will is the notion of the will 
and the laws are the special clauses of this will and based upon the notion of it. So back to those words, what I said was volonté général, uh, as it is said by Google Translate, volonté générale, meaning the general will. And what I said, and what I said, volonté de tous, uh, it said, volonté de tous, volonté de tous, uh, the will of all. Encyclopedia, section 163, infra section 2. We add a remark upon the account of the origin and formation of notions, which is usually given in the logic of understanding. It is not we who frame the notions. The notion is not something which is originated at all. No doubt the notion is not mere being or the immediate. It involves mediation, but the mediation lies in itself. In other words, the notion is what is mediated through itself and with itself. It is a mistake to imagine that the objects which form the content of our mental ideas come first and that our subjective agency then supervenes. And by the aforesaid operation of abstraction, and by colligating the points possessed in common by the objects, frames notions of them. Rather, the notion is the genuine first, and things are what they are through the action of the notion, eminent in them, and revealing itself in them. In religious language, we express this by saying that God created the world out of nothing. In other words, the world and finite things have issued from the fullness of the divine thoughts and the divine decrees. Thus, religion recognizes thought and, more exactly, the notion to be the infinite form or the free creative activity which can realize itself without the help of matter that exists outside it. Encyclopedia, section 164. The notion is concrete out and out because the negative unity with itself as characterization, pure and entire, which is individuality, is just what constitutes its self-relation, its universality. The functions or moments of the notion are to this extent indissoluble. The categories of reflection are expected to be severally apprehended and separately accepted as current apart from their opposites. But in the notion where their identity is expressly assumed, each of its functions can be immediately apprehended only from and with the rest. Universality, particularity, and individuality are taken in the abstract, the same as in identity, difference, and ground. But the universal is the self-identical with the express qualification that it simultaneously contains the particular and the individual. Again, the particular, again, the particular is the different or the specific character, but with the qualification that it is in itself universal and is an individual. Similarly, the individual must be understood to be a subject or a substratum, which involves the genus and species in itself and possesses a substantial existence. Such is the explicit or realized inseparability of the functions of the notion 
in their difference. See Encyclopedia section 160. What may be called the clearness of the notion in which each distinction causes no dimness or interruption, but is quite as much transparent. No complaint is oftener made against the notion than that it is abstract. Of course it is abstract. If abstract means that the medium in which the notion exists is thought in general and not the sensible thing in its empirical concreteness, it is abstract also because the notion falls short of the idea. To this extent, the subjective notion is still formal. This, however, does not mean that it ought to have or receive another content than its own. It is itself the absolute form, and so is all specific character, but as that character is in its truth. Although it be abstract, therefore, it is the concrete, concrete altogether, the subject as such. The absolutely concrete is the mind. See end of section 159. The notion when it exists as notion distinguishing itself from its objectivity, which, notwithstanding the distinction, still continues to be its own. Everything else which is concrete, however rich it be, is not so intensely identical with itself and therefore not so concrete on its own part. Lest Pardon, least of all, what is commonly supposed to be concrete, but is only a congeries held together by external influence, what are called notions, and in fact specific notions, such as man, house, animal, and similar, are simply denotations and abstract representations, these abstractions retain out of all the functions of the notion only that of universality. They leave particularity and individuality out of account and have no development in these directions. By so doing, they just miss the notion. Encyclopedia section 165. It is the element of individuality which first explicitly differentiates the elements of the notion. Individuality is the negative reflection of the notion into itself, and it is in that way at first the free differentiating of it as the first negation by which the specific character of the notion is realized, but under the form of particularity. That is to say, the different elements are in the first place only qualified as the several elements of the notion, and secondly, their identity is no less explicitly stated the one being said to be the other. This realized particularity of the notion is the judgment. The ordinary classification of notions as clear, distinct, and adequate is no part of the notion. The ordinary classification of notions as clear, distinct, and adequate is no part of the notion. It belongs to psychology. Notions, in fact, are here synonymous with mental representations. A clear notion is an abstract, simple representation. A distinct notion is one where, in addition to the simplicity, there is one mark or character emphasized as a sign for subjective cognition. 
there is no more striking mark of the formalism and decay of logic than the favorite category of the mark. The adequate notion the adequate notion comes near the notion proper or even the idea, but after all, it expresses only the formal circumstance that a notion or representation agrees with its object, that is, with an external thing, the division into what are called subordinate and coordinate notions implies a mechanical distinction of universal from particular, which allows only a mere correlation of them in external comparison. Again, an enumeration of such kinds as contrary and contradictory, affirmative and negative notions, and such or similar, is only a chance directed gleaning of logical forms which properly belong to the sphere of being or essence where they have been already examined and which have nothing to do with the specific notational character as such. The true distinctions in the notion, universal, particular, and individual, may be said also to constitute species of it, but only when they are kept severed from each other by external reflection. The eminent differentiating and specifying of the notion come to sight in the judgment, for to judge is to specify the notion. Zenith. Zenith. Uh, and that is end of uh, the infra subdivision, the notion as notion. Uh, you will hear from time to time an announcement uh, coming from a program called Calendar 93. Uh, this is a function of an occult organization uh, that uses 93 as a cognomen, and it uh, what this calendar does is it announces the, there are some, before we get there, the notion, uh, there are astrological times. Uh, in the tradition of the Maya, these are very large time periods. Uh, I would represent them in Ptolemaic astronomy or astrology as, uh, we call them constellations. Um, and these are zodi zodiacal uh, constellations. So a zodiacal constellation, let's say the constellation of Leo or Aquarius, is a certain amount of time across. So it may take uh, 300,000 light years to cross a portion of Aries. And if you were to go and consider it three-dimensionally, uh, because the stars are not in one plane, uh, they are in a three-dimensional uh, organization with each other. If you were to go deep into the star, if you were to go from the alpha star to a, a zeta star, you may go from 300,000 years uh, into it as well. So these large groups, these Leo, Aries, Aquarius, are real time distinctions, and they would be like the Maya, these very large groupings. Uh, you also have what are called, uh, uh, you know, ash, uh, lunar uh, mansions, which show that the moon, as we see it from our part of the earth, is at that that day uh, aimed uh, from as if uh, like a minute hand at a certain star or a certain uh, cluster of stars. So today. Uh, today is about the 18th, let's say, of the, the lunar month, uh, the 18th lunar mansion. The 14th or 15th is the full moon. Uh, so I'm estimating that today is about the 18th. Uh, so today, uh, if we were to look at the moon and we're able to follow the moon as a minute hand beyond it, uh, you would be in the constellation of Aries. Now, every constellation has 
uh, about 30 degrees. Uh, every degree is uh, as if it were a minute. So every constellation has a minute. Uh, and today we are at the 17th degree of Aries, if you looked at the moon straight out. However, and so that would be the way that the Aztecs look at time, uh, somewhat a bit shorter. And the Aztecs go further uh, and, and offer you uh, even every hour has a, uh, has a planetary time. Uh, so this planetary time now uh, that we're in, I believe, is uh, Mars. Uh, this hour of Mars, and, and they kind of repeat throughout the day, beginning in the morning. Uh, the sun, though, and I would consider this closer to a Mayan time. Uh, if you were to look at where the sun is today and for the next maybe couple of days, uh, it is an hour hand pointing toward the constellation of Cancer. So from the Earth, especially for the Northern Hemisphere, uh, you would see the sun uh, generally throughout the day. And if you could remember where it was or still see it when the stars came up, it would be pointing at the constellation of Cancer. Uh, so the hour hand, which is our sun, is pointing at the constellation of Cancer, the crab. And the minute hand, the moon, is pointing at, uh, and so 27 degrees, uh, 27 minutes, 27 of 30, you can say, of uh, the cancer, uh, cancer of the crab uh, is where the sun is. And 17 uh, minutes uh, or degrees of 30 of Aries is where the moon is going to be pointing. Uh, and so because of that, if it mattered to anyone, uh, you would know where we were in space in comparison to our relatively local uh, grouping of constellations. It will matter uh, in the future uh, where we are um, if we want to launch uh, spacecraft, and it matters now, uh, to go to certain areas and know where you are at that point. Uh, so we we'll use Earth as a reference, but it could still be that on Mars uh, you would look for for instance, uh, as long as it lasts, where uh, Deimos, a uh, moon of Mars, uh, happens to be, Mars has two moons, but where Deimos is uh, and where it happens to be in the constellation, uh, they move very quickly, but it could still work. Uh, and you would also look at where Deimos is and where uh, the sun is. It should be relatively in the same place as it is on Earth, but it may not be. And you could tell distance that way. Um, if you wanted, for instance, to tell uh, your friends and uh, who orbit uh, Sirius Beta, uh, the, the, the white dwarf, where you are, uh, they may be able to find you if you say, I can see uh, that my son, uh, which is Sirius Gamma, is aimed at 27 degrees Cancer. And my moon, if it's helpful at all, I don't know what your surveillance is like, is aimed at 17 degrees Aries. Uh, if you were able to type that in, like a GPS coordinate, you would know, uh, or a latitude and longitude, you can determine generally where a person is. But to do so, uh, you would have to have a central location. And I believe uh, that central location will always be Earth. So you will say that Earth being the center of the universe, uh, relatively, uh, will be the place where we'll determine where something is. So in relation to Earth, which is at 27 degrees, uh, where, where the sun is pointing at 27 degrees out of 30 to Cancer, the crab, and its moon is pointing at 17 degrees, Aries, in relation to where it is, uh, we are somewhere else. We're at uh, you know, a derivation of 15 away from that. Uh, and you can use the uh, astronomical unit. So one, the distance from the Earth to the Sun, and to say the average distance from the Earth to the Sun, is what we call one astronomical unit. Uh, this, the Moon is, on average, one-tenth of an astronomical unit away. Uh, it's one-tenth of an astronomical unit. Uh, and the Sun is one astronomical unit. Uh, so these are a way that you can, by knowing those, uh, the Earth could be the center point from which the GPS of the Lisa Loco uh, 
galactic area is is understood and known so these systems here have been around for some time literally some time uh for at least about six thousand years to determine where we are in space and i would argue uh for a person who believes in angels and angels being physical beings who may be coming from elsewhere uh that this is an easy way or a way uh to determine where earth is and therefore where anything in the galaxy is so when the catholic church said that the earth is the center of the universe uh, they were making a relativity statement uh, that keep it as the center of the universe as the place from which all things are relative and uh, in doing so uh, you will be able to know uh, a bit more about you then then everything outside of it uh, will be relative to that and i pardon me the actual uh, degree uh, for today is uh, the sun is 28 degrees cancer and uh, the moon is pointing to 29 degrees Aries uh, and so there we're not using precession uh, so from Aries uh, we're not using backwards precession so Aries will lead uh, uh, Aries will lead, well to the next uh, Aries is the very first of the astrological uh signs of 12 and that we'll be heading into the second one uh which i believe is taurus but i may be off all right so uh going back to the text how did i get on that it doesn't really matter uh we're going to move on to uh the next section hegel encyclopedia of philosophy section one logic the science of the idea in and for itself. And I'm going to uh, introduce something here, uh, which is an Arabic phrase, because I said at the beginning of chapter nine uh, that we are talking now about the notion, and you won't hear, and I haven't heard uh, the word that's repeated over and over again uh, in the first eight chapters, that word is God. God, 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 God has been re said over and over again uh i think in this chapter i think it was understood that some people would only read chapter nine because it doesn't mention god specifically and it mentions christianity as a philosophy more than a religion so where is god in here god is the notion uh but i'm keep and so that that's the god that is the, the notion that the one that you can grasp uh, a Christian would say that that would be Jesus Christ himself, um, whereas other people, for instance, would say uh, it was. So if you are a Vishnavi, a person who considers uh, Vishnu uh, as the, the the direct head of uh, Prabhupada Vishnu, as the, the head of uh, the pantheon of the Hindu trinity of Vishnu, uh, Shiva, and Krish uh, Vishnu, Shiva, and Brahma, pardon, Vishnu, Shiva, and Brahma, you would say that uh, the notion would be uh, Vishnu, if I was a Vishnu. Uh, if you were a uh, Shabai or Shifawi, uh, you would say that Shiva uh, is the the notion. Um, and if you are a Brahmin and all is Brahmin, uh, all is Brahma, you would say that the notion clearly is Brahma. Uh, and so th those are the ways to go about it. I'm going to go back to the beginning of this categorization, because I've named this the science of the idea in it for itself. But that phrase, the science of the idea in it for itself, is within the text. So I'm translating that into Arabic uh, as Bilahi, Bilahil, that, wa Lillahi. Jama. Uh, what does that mean? I, I explained before that the name of God in Arabic is pre. Well, I haven't explained this, but you should know the name of God in Arabic predates uh, the current Islamic tradition uh, by a very long time. The Islamic tradition began uh, around the year uh, officially 622 uh, or so, or maybe a bit before that, so 600 AD. Uh, and Allah means law is God, and El is uh, so law is a God, and El is 
a proper name for the God of Israel. Uh, so uh, the, the chief God. So El Law is the chief God of gods. Um, now the chief God of gods uh, is distinguished, and we've been distinguishing this before this. Uh, I'm saying by the word that, uh, this goes to uh, neo-Aristotelian philosophy from around the year 900, a man named Ibn al-Arabi and his uh, cohort. Uh, he's a, from Marcia in Spain. Uh, his, you can call him Orabi or Wayne. Uh, he is the ancestor of the current king of Spain. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> who is named uh, Felipe Alfonso, his majesty, the king, uh, Orabi Wayne, uh, Felipe the sixth Alfonso. Uh, so this is his relative. Uh, and so he distinguishes between essence and unity. Uh, so the essence is called that, and we've been discussing essence. And now, and then there is unity, jama, uh, that which is uh, itself or together, uh, the the idea. Uh, and so I have here, and there is a linguistic difference for those who speak Arabic. Billahil that. So by the chief god of gods, essence, and lillahi jama. So for, or through, but for the God of God's unity. So by the God of God's essence and for the God of, for God's unity. So that's what we, uh, by the God of God's essence and for God's unity. Um, there is some esoteric scholars who may not be happy with that, but sit down with a teacher who knows Ibn al-Arabi and he'll clear it right up for you. Uh, so I'm going to add that to it just for those who speak Arabic or who you'll see later on if you haven't already listened to part three. Uh, part two is going to be going to have to wait for some time. Uh, part three, which talks about uh, the psychology of the mind of, of, or the, philo the philosophy of mind. Uh, there's a lot of German in it uh, to explain difficult topics. So at this point, I'm just adding the Arabic. Uh, so it says, or it can even say so, but for or by, by or as a result of the God of God's essence and for the unity possessed by the God of God's, uh, you can say. Uh, and you can play around with those and see why it would be going back and forth. Hegel says of the concept of a singular deity, almost an atheistic being, which has no form, uh, is the very beginning of Gnosis. That's where you start. And then he, uh, you have the um, emanation theory, he differentiates himself. So you go back to that poem that said, I can stand here on my mountain of eight chapters of Hegel's logic and uh, piling on example upon example and how to read it and all the rest of that. And it is not until I remove all of it that I see you and you being God. Uh, so he's removed the name God and we're going back to piling on things, I, I think. Uh, enough philosophy uh, for now, <laughs> at least in my own particular understanding of the deity. Uh, I don't like when it becomes, I've been taught not to care for it becoming too esoteric uh, because people then became, began worshiping the, the poetry and forgetting the, the, the purpose of it. Uh, and that is considered bad. <laughs> so do what you will. Uh, and know that your will will have results, and the results of your will will be freely acquired. And so don't think that when the results come of your will that you are enslaved, you are free. Uh, though that freedom you're experiencing uh, may not be as comfortable, or may be extremely comfortable, depending on the original will. Hegel, Encyclopedia of Philosophy, 
Section 1, Logic, the Science of the Idea in and for Itself, Bilahilat wa Lillahi Jama. Chapter 9, Third Subdivision of Logic, the Doctrine of the Notion, Quasi Subdivision A, the Subjective Notion, Infra Subdivision B, the Judgment. Encyclopedia section 166. The judgment is the notion in its particularity as a connection, which is also a distinguishing of its functions, which are put as independent and yet as identical with themselves, not with one another. One's first impression about the judgment is the independence of the two extremes the subject and the predicate. The former we take to be a thing or term per se, and the predicate a general term outside the said subject and somewhere in our heads. The next point is for us to bring the latter into combination with the former, and in this way frame a judgment. The copula is, however, enunciates the copula is, however, enunciates the predicate of the subject, and so that external subjective subsumption is again put in abeyance, and the judgment taken as a determination of the object itself. The etymological meaning of the judgment, urthil, in German goes deeper, as it were declaring the unity of the notion to be primary and its distinction to be the original partition, and that is what the judgment really is. The judgment, Urtal, in German goes deeper, as it were declaring the unity of the notion to be primary and its distinction to be the original partition, and that is what the judgment really is. In its abstract terms, a judgment is expressible in the proposition, the individual is the universal. These are the terms under which the judgment and the predicate first confront each other. When the functions of the notion are taken in their immediate character or first abstraction, Propositions such as the particular is the universal and the individual is the particular belong to the further specialization of the judgment. The individual is the particular belong to the further specialization of the judgment. It shows a strange want of observation in the logic books that in none of them is the fact stated that in every judgment there is such a statement made as the individual is the universal or still more definitely the subject is the predicate. Ergo, God is absolute spirit. But, no doubt there is also a distinction between terms like individual and universal, subject and predicate, but it is nonetheless the universal fact that every judgment states them to be identical. The copula is springs from the nature of the notion to be self-identical even in parting with its own. The individual and universal are its constituents and therefore characteristics which cannot be isolated. The earlier categories of reflection in their correlations also refer to one another.
but their interconnection is only having and not being. In essence, it is not the identity which is realized as identity or universality. In the judgment, therefore, for the first time, there is seen the genuine particularity of the notion. For it is the specialty or distinguishing of the latter without, for it is the specialty or distinguishing of the latter without thereby losing universality. Judgments are generally looked upon as combinations of notions and, be it added, of heterogeneous notions. This theory of judgment is correct. Jupiter says. This theory of judgment is correct so far as it applies that it is the notion which forms the presupposition of the judgment, and which in the judgment comes up under the form of difference. But on the other hand, it is false to speak of notions differing in kind. The notion, although concrete, is still as a notion essentially one, and the functions which it contains are not different kinds of it. It is equally false to speak of a combination of the two sides in the judgment if we understand the term combination to imply the immediate existence of the combining members apart from the combination. The same external view of their nature is more forcibly apparent when judgments are described as produced by the ascription of a predicate to the subject. Language like this looks upon the subject as self-subsistent outside, and the predicate as found somewhere in our head. Such a conception of the relation between subject and predicate, however, is at once contradicted by the copula is. By saying this rose is red, or this picture is beautiful, we declare that it is not we who from outside attach beauty to the picture or redness to the rose, but that these are the characteristics proper to these objects.